yes, the, hi everyone. The, the goal of my talk today is going to give you theoretical insight and practical guidelines if you have to handle missing values in a learning problem. Okay, so what motivates this work is typically this kind of data. It's a clinical database. And here, every black entry is a missing entry. There's no value in there. Uh, you see that for almost every clinical variable, we have at least miss one missing value, and almost every patient has uh, at least one missing value. So if you suppose that here, someone asks you to train a prediction model, let's say for a hemorrhagic shock, you have to do with missing values, uh, to do something with missing values first, because most models do not handle missing values natively. So the question we want to answer is, what should you do? So there has been uh, quite a lot of literature on missing values since the 70s. And actually, it has been mainly focused on imputation and inference. So imputation is the task of filling in uh, the missing entries with likely values. And so if you look at the textbooks, you'll see that the classical methods comprise expectation maximization, MICE, which is multiple imputation by chain equation, matrix factorization as for recommended systems. And also recently you've had a lot of uh, approaches based on GANs, VAE, graph neural networks, optimal transport, everything is tried for imputation. And the second task that's been studied a lot is inference, so trying to estimate means or variances of uh, some uh, variables, uh, despite missing values in them. So here in textbooks, you find mostly methods based on likelihood-based inference, uh, multiple imputation, and inverse probability weighting, something similar than what's used in causal inference, if you know a bit about it. So most of this method uh, rely on certain assumption on the missingness mechanisms. So actually, the, how the missing values uh, arise is classified into three mechanisms. And they have been introduced also in the 70s uh, to make inference or imputation valid. So you have three of them. The first is MCAR, missing completely at random. Uh, so this is the strongest assumption. Basically, in MCAR, I may, I may use that maybe. Okay. In missing completely at random, the probability that a variable is missing. So here, M2 would be a binary indicator, indicating whether variable 2 is missing or not. So the probability that the second variable is missing uh, doesn't depend on x. It's a constant value. So basically, it's going to, uh, to be a coin flip, whether you're missing or not. So very simple. Uh, another assumption is called missing at random. So it's not very well named because it's not missing at random. Here, the probability of the second variable to be missing can depend on other variable, but it just has to depend on variable which doesn't have missing values themselves. Okay. So actually, MCAR is included in MAR. MCAR is stronger than MAR. And everything that I showed to you just before uh, require the more assumption, basically. And it's why the more assumption has been introduced in the first place. And lastly, you have everything else which is gathered into the missing non at random mechanism. So here, uh, typically, the second variable can be missing depending on its own value. So let's say if my variable takes high values, it's going to be missing most probably. So this is a missing not at random mechanism. Okay. So that is for uh, the literature that's been going on for the last 50 years. Now, what I'm interested in is more the supervised learning with missing values, whether it is regression or classification. And in this area, the works are much scarcer. Um, here we want to consider inputs where, which can have missing values, so in the design matrix. So typically here, let's say you have a design matrix. So it can have missing values in the second variable or in the first and the fourth, etc. anywhere. So in your data, if you typically have 50 variables, you may have up to t to the uh, 2 to the power 50 uh, possible missing data mechanisms. So it's 
quite quickly a very, very large amount of possible missing data patterns. So it poses statistical challenges. So what do people do with that? Well, what they usually do is to first fill in the missing values with something and then proceed with the normal way of learning the, the model. Okay. So you impute your data and then, for example, you do your regression. So here the question we want, I want to ask and answer or the following. First, we will um, see whether we have theoretical foundations for this widespread practice of first imputing and then doing your regression. Do we have theoretical grounding for doing that? Second, we will wonder whether we need to impute well to predict well or not in practice. This is really a, an important question and the answer is not that clear and obvious. And finally, if we have time, we'll look at some uh, real databases, clinical databases, and see how different approaches compare on there, uh, in them. But so let's start with the theoretical um, results. Okay, so here I'm going to talk about impuse then, then regress procedures, so just to formalize things a little bit. I will talk about functions of the form g of phi. So here are your, your phi. Your phi is just going to be a function that imputes the data. So for example, for, for the first variable which is missing, it's going to compute a function of the observed value. So here, a function of x2 and x3. And so it's a conditional imputation on the observed variable. And on my imputation with my imputation function, I compose a prediction function g, which is just a normal function applied to the imputed data. And so we ask three questions. First, if you consider a function of this form, can they be bias optimal? Meaning, can they reach the best possible performances on a data set with missing value, yes or no? How should we choose the imputation function for, to have something that's potentially bias optimal? And what happens if the data is missing not at random? So you remember almost everything that exists for inference or imputation works in the missing at random hypothesis. In a prediction setting, what happens if the data is not missing at random? So we answer to these questions. So just a few assumptions or maybe notations to answer to these. So here we are going to suppose that the response y is uh, a function of the complete data plus some noise. So just very light assumption. And we focus on the following optimization problem. We want to minimize the squared loss uh, on the incomplete data because it's what is available. So here the f uh, function that we want to optimize, we will consider it's an impute then regress procedure. It's g of phi. And the definition of a bias predictor is just a, mi a minimizer of this risk. And we know that a minimizer of the squared loss uh, is written as the expectation of y given the observed data and the missingness indicator. So m, it's just a vector of size t, the number of variables with zero and ones indicating whether your variable is observed or missing in a sample. So this is the expression of the Bayes predictor. And so the Bayes rate is going to be the risk of the Bayes predictor. It's the lowest achievable risk on the problem. And the function is Bayes optimal if it achieves the Bayes rate. So let's go back to the question. Can impute then regress procedures be Bayes optimal, yes or no? So actually, we showed that yes, they can. And in fact, it's much stronger than that. In fact, they almost always are. So let me uh, give you the, the theorem and we'll explain it afterwards. So if you consider that G five star is a minimizer of the risk on your imputed data, uh, then assume that uh, your imputation is C infinite, so it's not a strong assumption, and that your response Y is generated as F star of X plus some noise. Then for all missing data mechanisms and all imputation functions, then your uh, G phi star of phi is going to be base optimal. So in other words, for almost all imputation function, a universally consistent algorithm that is trained on imputed data is going to be base consistent. So it's an asymptotic result which, te which tells you that uh, 
whatever the imputation function that you choose, if you have enough data, then you're going to reach the best possible performance. It's an, an asymptotic result. But the fact that you can choose any possible imputation function means that you can choose something very cheap and very simple, such as the mean imputation. And for a supervised learning setting, it's going to be OK. And the second important point is for all missing data mechanisms. So it means including missing not at random settings. Uh, so what this says is that for supervised learning settings, the classification into m karma uh, and missing not at random is not that important. Here, missing not at random is not a problem for learning the best possible predictor. So I'm now going to give you a bit an idea of why this theorem is true, like just a sketch of, of the proof. Because it gives a nice insights into the, into the problem. So here on the left, you have some data, some complete data. And on the right, you have uh, an imputed version of this data. And you see that after imputation, so here we chose just an imputation of our choice. And you see that after imputation, the data points each fold on a manifold, depending on which original missing data pattern there was at the beginning. So the, the brown, red, and purple curves they each correspond to an initial missing data pattern with two missing values. And each surface, blue, green, orange, they correspond each to a missing data pattern with ordinarily one missing uh, value. Okay. So the first thing in the proof is to show that indeed, after imputation, um, all data points with a missing data pattern M are mapped to a certain manifold of dimension, the number of observed values. So this is the, is the first point, to see what the data looks like after imputation. Then the second point, which was maybe the most difficult, is to, is to show that once you have imputed your data, actually the original missing data pattern of your data is encoded into the manifold. If I check the image on the right, I can almost surely say, if I pick a point, what was his initial missing data pattern. So actually, we showed this with the Tom transversality theorem. It's an old theorem from differential topology. The notion of transversality is, is just a notion that describes how manifold intersect. And the fact that two manifolds are transverse is roughly meaning that uh, it's a contrary of being tangent. Okay. So what this theorem says is actually for almost all imputation function, the resulting manifold uh, or, or not going to be, uh, they're going to be transverse. And that means that uh, their intersection is going to have a dimension that's always less than the dimension of the two manifold that intersect. And because of that, for almost all points, we are going to be able to say what was the original missing data pattern of the point. And once we've done that, it's easy. Once we've done that, we can build a function that is just going to take the optimal value on the imputed space for each missing data pattern. Okay. So this is the idea of the, of the theorem. So now what does it mean? If we recap, we have some data. Suppose that we do mean imputation on the data. What we know is that if we want to do inference on, on this data set, it's not OK because the distribution is distorted. But for supervised learning uh, uh, objectives, it's OK because given enough data, to, we are going to be able to obtain the best optimal uh, predictor. So one could say, OK, so now that we have this, why bother? We are, going to, we are going to use only mean imputation here and do not think further. But the thing is, our theoretical result is asymptotic, meaning if you have a uh, finite amount of samples, then what happens? Uh, can a good imputation still provide an easier learning problem if you have a good imputation compared to the mean? That's an, a question that remains. So actually, in, we don't have theoretical results for this part, and I, I don't think there are theoretical results in the literature. So we started with an empirical study to try to answer this question. And this is the second part that I want to, to present. 
So the question is here, should we impute well to predict well? And honestly, when we started the project, we didn't have the answer. It's not obvious whether yes or no, it's the case. So it's still an ongoing work. Um, so people have already thought about this question. So there are a few works in the literature that try to benchmark uh, imputation plus prediction procedures and see what happens. The thing is, I, what I found when I was reviewing this literature is that in many works, we have a serious limitation that I think hinders the conclusion. So I just listed a few. Uh, so for example, you have works where the imputation is performed separately on the train and test set. So that means, for example, uh, if you take uh, the example of normalizing your data, it would mean uh, learning the mean and standard deviation on the train set, standardizing your train set, and then learning the mean and uh, sigma in your test set and standardizing there. So it's not something that's uh, good. Then you had uh, something with no hyperparameter optimization, neither for the imputation nor for the prediction models. So if you don't do this, maybe, um, yeah, your, your prediction model is not at its best uh, capacity. You have works where the hyperparameters are optimized on the complete data once for all. And then when people train models on the incomplete data, they keep these hyperparameters. But the thing is that you should retrain your hyperparameters for each imputed data set. So it's not OK. We had a work where missing values were introduced in a single variable chosen at random. So this is a serious problem, because if you choose it at random, maybe this variable is not so predictive of the outcome. So in that case, you can impute it the way you want. It will have no impact on the prediction quality, or maybe uh, I don't know, this variable is correlated with no other in the data set, so you can't impute it. And so depending on which variable you choose for imputation, then you can have very different uh, conclusions. OK, and so works which only use a linear model for prediction, but we think that the way prediction, uh, imputation impact prediction can depend on your subsequent model that you use. OK, and then the number of data sets that are used are not always a lot. So for example, four data sets is maybe not enough to draw general conclusions. And so many of these limitations have actually been, I think, driven by the fact that this kind of experiments require a lot of, uh, of uh, CPU time. And so for some time, it's easier to just do the kind of uh, choices to reduce the computational time. And more of a few works draw insights into when and why imputation helps prediction or not. So we'll try to, to draw these kind of insights. OK, so our goal here will be really to compute basically correlations between imputation and prediction quality and see wh whether there's a correlation and determining if and when imputation improves prediction. And as, as I said, we strive to set up experiments in order to gather useful insights. So for that, we want to have the impact of the downstream prediction model. So we use a number of different prediction models, not only linear models, for example. We want to see the impact of the missingness indicator. In missing values, it's a general practice to add the mask, to append the mask to your features. You have your D features, you concatenate your mask of size D, and you learn on that. So widespread practice. So we also compare to this practice with and without the mask. Uh, then we also wanted to see what was the impact of the outcome nonlinearity. You have a lot of works which uh, concentrates on linear models, so we wanted to see also what happens on nonlinear models. And finally, we'll use 20 datasets to try to have uh, the most the most that we can a uh, generalization generalize, generalizing conclusions. Okay. So I'll tell you what, the, what are the data sets we use, the prediction models we use, and then I'll show you the results. So for the data sets which actually chose a benchmark suit that's been uh, published with a recent paper that was comparing deep neural networks and uh, trees on uh, tabular data sets. So we chose this data. Um, and what we like with this benchmark suit is that it's a regression task with numerical features only. 
And here we added M core missingness. So it's a bit restrictive. But actually, the goal here is to set up a favorable ground for imputation to impact prediction so that we will have an upper bound of how much imputation can have prediction. And for each data set, we create a semi-synthetic version where we create an outcome that's a linear version of the real data X on top of the real outcomes Y. Now for the prediction models, um, we chose three models. The first one, uh, which is a, just a simple material perceptual it's baseline. And then we chose one representative of a tabular deep model and the representative of a tree-based model. So here you have Saint. It's an architecture based on a column and a row attention. And it's been shown in the paper that I was talking about to be the best uh, tabular deep learning representative. And XGBoost, which uh, still according to this paper was the best tree-based models on the tabular data. Now for the imputation strategies, we chose four of them. The goal is not to choose the best possible imputation strategies based on a new method. The goal is to have a, a, a wide range of uh, qualities so that we can compute correlations. So for that, for that, we chose the mean imputation, which gives up normally the lowest imputation quality. Then we have a classical method. It's MICE. It's an, ir in a, an iterative imputation where you first fill in your missing values with something, for example, the mean. And then iteratively, you take each variable and you predict the missing values based on all the other columns. And you do this column after column and you repeat until some kind of convergence. And uh, then you have Miss Forest. This one is uh, one of the best performing method currently. It's the same thing as the mice, but uh, you use a forest instead of a ridge model that we had in iterative. And finally, we have something that we called condeps. It's just a method where you compute a mean and the covariance matrix from your data empirically. Then you suppose your data is Gaussian and you compute the conditional expectation of your data to impute. So that's going to be our four imputation methods. And uh, in our experiments, uh, already this cost, uh, it took us the equivalent of one year on one CPU. It's not that huge, but it's still quite a lot. And the reason of that is that we have 26 imputing regress models to test if we count with and without the mask. We have uh, we do 50 trials of hyperparameter tuning for each model using Optuna. So we draw randomly uh, 50 hyperparameters, train the models 50 times, record the best on the validation set, and so on. We repeated each experiment 10 times. So we had 10 splits into train val test sets, and uh, 10 times the generation of the missing data is like uh, done. In, uh, uh, it's a new missing values. And finally, we have 20 data sets, but each data set is duplicated because we also simulate the Y with linear outcome. So what does it give? So here, this is just a first figure. It's not the, all the results at all to show you a bit what the data li looks like. So here we have just have the results for the MLP without uh, use of the mask as input on real data. So no linear outcome. Each uh, panel is one data set. X axis is the imputation quality and Y axis is uh, regression quality measured as R2 score. And each color is an imputation uh, given by the legend. So here you see that for this model, in this case, you have some data sets where you have a lot of, uh, of correlation between imputation quality and uh, and regression quality, so superconductor and uh, isolate, a lot of correlation. And others, should, such as this one, California, where there's absolutely no correlation. Okay. So th this is just for the MLP. Now let me show you the figure which gathers all the results. Okay. So here, each box plot actually comes from one figure that I showed before. So typically here, uh, for the MLP here, the MLP uh, with the dark gray is the MLP without the mask on real data. So on the left, it's real data, dark color uh, without the mask. 
and this is the MLP. And here each point corresponds to one data set. So you see that the pink points at the top, they correspond to superconduct your isolate. These were the three with a lot of correlations here. Okay. And then you have California here with that correlation that ends up here at the very bottom in a kind of uh, brown green color. Okay. So each box block is this 20 plots. So we have a lot of uh, things to, to see here. And the first thing that strikes me is that actually the good imputation matter less when the response is nonlinear. So if you look at the correlation on the left versus on the right, you see that on the right, the correlations are higher, meaning that when your outcome in li is linear, apparently the imputation quality is going to be more important. So that makes a bit of sense because you, actually the Bayes predictor in the linear case can be written as the best possible imputation and a linear model on the best possible imputation. So it's basically going to be beta transpose the best possible imputation. So we could have thought that actually for a linear model, imputation is going to matter. And that's a bit what we found. And we also found that when your outcome is real outcome, normally nonlinear, the imputation quality matters less. That's the first insight. Then uh, what we see is that the good imputation matter less for uh, more expressive models. So actually, we thought that the MLP would be the less expressive model, followed by Saint and followed by XGBoost, which is a tree model, which is very well adapted to tabular data. And if you look, for example, at the real, uh, at the real outcome, you see that the, co the correlations for the MLP are more around 0.6. Then it's more around 0.5 for Saint and more around uh, 0.3 for um, XGBoost. So depending on the model that you had after your imputation, the imputation quality is going to matter less. And actually, the more you have a flexible model behind, then the, the less the imputation uh, apparently matters. And this is actually in um, aligned with our theoretical results. Because what we saw in the theory is that you can have a very simple imputation as long as the model behind, uh, behind is universally consistent. So as long as it's very flexible to cope with the fact that you didn't impute so well. So we recover that kind of results in this experiments, experimental setting. And also I didn't um, insist on that, but you see that I'm talking about averages, but you have data sets where Really, there's absolutely no correlation. The correlation is at zero. And the data sets where it's the contrary. It's very highly correlated. So these quantities were correlations. So when we look at correlation, it doesn't tell us what is the effect size of imputation quality on prediction quality. It just talks about correlation. So in correlation, there's a the notion of significancy. So how much noise there is in the, in the the relationship. So then we look at the effects of imputation quality on prediction quality. So that's basically you learn the coefficient. If you regress uh, prediction on imputation quality uh, in a linear model, you get a coefficient, a slope. And this is the effect that we give here. So here, what you see is actually that the good imputation matter less when you use the mask. It's very clear when you compare dark gray box plot and light gray ones, uh, the size of the effect clearly decreases. So this is a, a very a quite a clear finding here. So when you use the mask, you should care less about imputation apparently. So as a conclusion, the better amputation are not always worth it. This is basically the, what we say here. The more expressive models you have, uh, the more nonlinear outcomes you have. And if you use the mask, then your imputation is probably going to be not that important on average. OK. OK. So now I'm going just to show you the, like the kind of a normal plot of performance just to see what works best if we look at this 
um, work as a benchmark. So here, the y-axis is the prediction performance given as the R2 on the test set. And uh, each color corresponds to the unimputation, and you have on the left the MLP, on the right XGBoost, and in the middle synced. So if we look at uh, the, if we do a significant significativity test, you see that the best method, there are three of them which are uh, like uh, all together the best methods. It includes, all of them include XGBoost. And uh, so two of them use the mask with an imputation, and one of them is the purple one, non plus XGBoost. This corresponds to XGBoost with the native handling of missing values. So with XGBoost, you have an option to learn direct directly with missing values. It doesn't exist for many models, but for trees, it does. And basically, what it does is that when you do a split uh, based on a variable, if it has missing values in there, it's going to optimize to put the sample with the missing value on the left or on the right of your split to optimize the criterion. Okay. And so this is one of the best methods, and actually, as it's very easy, it should maybe the advocate, be the advocated method. So maybe XGBoost without imputation is a good default. But we should be careful because here you see that there is a lot of, a lot of variance in the results. So it means that there's no one size fits all champion. XGBoost with native handling, for example, performs worse on four datasets, the worst one on four datasets. And it's the best one only in the quality of datasets. So it's, I think it's still a good idea to test a few a few methods among the best ones. And also we see again here that adding the mass as input is always beneficial. If uh, you compare each possible model with and without the mask, uh, with and without the mask, if you compare the two, the mask always significantly improve your results. And this is true even with MCAR data because here we have MCAR data. So actually this finding has not reported, been reported before. What's been reported before is that when you are in a missing not at random setting, the mask is useful. And it makes sense because in missing not at random, in the missingness in indicator, you have information. The fact that a uh, variable is missing means something. For example, your variable had a high value. But uh, in MCAR, it's not the case. And uh, this is it can it can be very surprising at first sight because in the missingness indicator there's absolutely no information about the outcome. The fact of being missing is just a random coin flip, so it has absolutely no information. So why does it help with predictions? So why, why, what we hypothesize is related to the theoretical work that I talked about. What we hypothesize is that in fact. Your best possible predictor on the imputed data here is going to be discontinuous. From a manifold to another, uh, unless your optimal prediction function on the complete data is linear, unless in this case you will have, di you will have discontinuities in your best possible function on the imputed data. And uh, we hypothesize that using the mask is going to help you build a function that is going to is going to jump a bit when it goes from one manifold to another. Because you have this, this binary indicators that allow you, for example, to change the bias of your model. But uh, we didn't show it uh, very properly. All right. And yes, I forgot to mention that currently in the literature in MCAR setting, it was just shown that adding the mask does not degrade performances asymptotically in linear models. Okay. So uh, that's that's all for this benchmark part. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> Five minutes? Okay. So uh, I will talk very um, quickly about the last part. Uh, the last part is about a benchmark on uh, BLHS databases. Uh, in the previous work, the missingness was MCAR because we wanted to draw insights. Now this work is on real data, so it's uh, four clinical databases. 
and for each of them, you have a task which is predicting uh, the presence of a melanoma, uh, death, or hemorrhagic shock, and so on. So you have a number of tasks for each uh, database. And in each database, you have a lot of missing values which, which were not uh, created. They are really here by design. And here you see the proportion of missing values. So the x-axis is just ordered variables from the one with the most missing values to the least. So you have missing values with almost <laughs> only missing values and variables, for example, with very few missing values. But it's just to say that it's not only two or three missing values around in the data set. And so in this match mark, we used uh, gradient boosted regression trees at a prediction model only. And we tested four ways of uh, imputing the missing, uh, missing data, the mean or median. Uh, we also used MICE, which is the same thing as before, iterative imputation with a linear model, and the K-Neural Snakeboard approach. And finally, we have MIA, which is just the native handling of missing values I was talking about before. So here are the results. You have four dataset sizes here. So we, each time we, are, we only give the results for the databases which were restricted to this size, this size, and so on. And on the left, all the possible imputation uh, me methods. And the x-axis gives you the, the performance score at the predict the, the performance score in classification or regression. So here, the first thing that you can see is that the mask improved the prediction again. So you have to compare uh, the light color with the dark color each time. It's the same imputation with and without the mask. And you'll see that the dark color always improves significantly the prediction. Here, it's maybe because there is information in the missingness indicator, or maybe because just as we saw even in MCAR, adding M uh, improves prediction. You see that the conditional imputation is on par with a very simpler method, which is the constant imputation. So the Red is on par with the blue and green. So spending time on better conditional imputation here did not improve the results compared to using just the mean imputation. And finally, the native handling of missing values. So the, the, the black here gives again the best results. So we have like concordant uh, clues with the previous work here on these three items. Okay, and just to, to, if we look at the importance of every feature, it's not only the features with a lot of missing, uh, with no missing data that are important, because you could say the, impu the imputation doesn't matter so much, because in fact the predictive variables do not have missing values. But what we show here is not the case. The importance is not a function of the missingness proportion. So even variables with low missing values can be important. So if I recap everything, the take home message would be that we have a theoretical foundation for impute and regress procedures. So we said that they are base optimal for all missing data mechanisms and almost all imputation function, even very cheap ones, which is nice. Um, about how well you should impute to predict well. Uh, I think the take home message here is beware of dim diminishing returns. It's may not, it may not be worth spending a lot of efforts, CPU effort and time into better imputation because it may not improve your prediction in the end. And finally, appending the mask as input is useful even if you are in MCAR setting. And that's, I think, an important message uh, also. And if you want to use a default for tabular data, uh, Tree-based model with native ending is still uh, nice. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Marine. Uh, are there any, any questions? I have many questions. <laughs> and, um, uh, so I, first, I wonder if my interpretation <coughs> of this adding the mask is correct. Like your are you allowing essentially for each missing pattern to build its own prediction model? Like that, that, that's what it means more or less to add the mask. But that's more or less, uh, oh, why adding the mask? No, but it is this interpretation that just like if you add the mask, 
in a way what you're saying, like for each missing pattern, I have a prediction function. But yes, I'm going to adapt slightly my prediction function to each missing data pattern. That's the correct intuition. Yes. And, uh, and then in the case where it works, um, OK, but it seems to always work. But it, because it, in general, you can have like two to the d different yeah. masks that you add, yeah. which essentially could be that you do not like yeah, you yeah. have too many models to do. Yeah, so that, that's a good question. I think maybe with the mask, you can adapt to group of missing data patterns, you know, I don't know, like not having the best possible function for each missingness uh, pattern, but having a better <laughs> invitation function for different groups. Uh, but it, it's not clear, actually, um, the exact why of this. Uh, yeah. Yes. So you mentioned that uh, for tree-based models, uh, there is a method to, uh, if I understood correctly, ignore the missing values when you split, uh, so that you can like deal with it. Yes. Uh, it seems like a very intuitive way to do it. Do you yes. think we can we could adapt such a method to other models like uh, KNN or like that? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. Everything I can say is that uh, in the Tabula Deep Networks uh, endeavors, for example, Saint, you have a way to natively deal with uh, missing values. That's why you had a purple plot for Saint. And in there, they just let a latent embedding for the fact that you have a, a NAN. Uh, and the same way they learn an embedding for each numerical feature. Each numerical feature is mapped to a d-dimensional embedding. And then because of that, every entry, including the missing one, have an embedding, and you continue with that. Okay. It's another way, different, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, can I continue with my question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you, uh, I, I, I don't know if you looked at this, but for, when you add in the mask, like you mentioned, two masks are really close and like in some hanging distance. Would it be true that the correspondent models are also kind of given very similar predictions in some sense, like as just functions? Let's say you affix two masks of the same size and, uh, and okay, they just differ in two positions. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's just a function from R to the side of the mask to R. But as functions, like would these functions be very similar or I don't know? You mean the learn function on yeah. the missingness indicator? I don't know. <laughs> I guess you can, if you if we want, we can build functions which are far away. Yeah, sure, sure. But uh, on average, are they far or not? I don't, I don't know, honestly. Yeah. I'm not sure. And for this condition, for all, for all imputation, for all, for almost all imputation mechanism, is it? Yeah. Like, what, what does it mean for, for almost all parts? Like yes, it means that um, you, there exists. Uh, imputation function for which it's not true mm -hmm. and typically it's going to be an imputation function which map two missing data patterns to exactly the same manifold or two manifolds which uh, have an intersection uh, of the size of the intersected manifold so if the inter intersect for example if you if the manifold is 1d and uh, when you impute for two different missing data patterns, the imputation end up to be the same line. Your, the initial missing data pattern of your points cannot be identified. You're completely confounded. And if you have that, it's absolutely impossible to have a base optimal prediction because for one point in the space, the optimal prediction are going to be different. Yeah, yeah that kind of subjectivity. That's the point. Any other questions? I can continue, but I think I will, I will continue <laughs> asking <laughs> <some> new questions <laughs> okay. after the, after the oh, Thank you. Thank you.